Crazy. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is John Anderson from the School of City and Regional Planning. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my experiences of using digital film technology to supplement, enhance and integrate in the lectures that I do in the School of City and Regional Planning, principally in human geography. So a couple of years ago, 2010, I got a grant from the Central University, a small grant to look into teaching innovation, principally how I could integrate things like this into my lectures and supplement, enhance, use them in, in particular ways. And it's all come, oh crikey, the joys of Prezi, and under the rubric, I suppose, as Simon mentioned, of lecture capture. And we all kind of understand lecture capture to mean different things, but we all have a kind of understanding that this is a buzzword that might get us money, that might get us grants, that might kind of in, perhaps even also enhance the, the pedagogical experience for students and perhaps even ourselves. And lecture capture has become the kind of the buzzword of the times, I suppose, because it's expected that it could realise some positives for, for us as academics, that through our lectures, by recording our lectures in these sorts of ways, we might be able to enhance uh, um, a distance learning market, to get people to access to our lectures who won't be able to necessarily get to um, particular timetabled slots in the working week. It might be useful for people whose la first language isn't English, so the things that the particular dialects or speeds of speaking or use of particular academic languages that might not be so familiar, by capturing our lectures, they can then look at them a second or a third or a fourth time and make sure they understand every, every component of it. Similarly, it might be useful for first and second language English speakers for their revision. Uh, they might want to cram the week before their exams or whatever happens to be their particular kind of learning strategy and revisit a particular lecture a second or a third or a fourth time. And also, it might afford us sabbatical opportunities. In CPLAN, it's quite difficult to get a sabbatical because we have to find someone who's going to replace our own teaching and other members of staff. Um, so if you, the idea being that if you recorded your lecture, then would you have to be available next semester because it would all be on a <coughs> CD that would be available or all, all online? Then, of course, that might actually be a downside to that because we could actually um, minimise the need for ourselves, depending on who owns the copyright to this material. So lecture capture is kind of the buzzword of the times, I guess. And uh, the availability of this sort of technology, with the availability of open minds to use that technology, meaning we kind of, uh, we could do it, and perhaps even we should do it. So I tried to use these things. And some of the practical issues in the kind of, can we actually do it, um, I came upon straight away. Um, these little cameras are great. I set it up exactly kind of like Simon, with kind of from the bottom up rather than great big lecture theatre with a great big lectern at the front. And um, I think Julian Hodge has that sort of material, but I didn't in CPAN. I wanted to just kind of play with these sorts of issues. And the first issue I came to, as I kind of experienced just then when uh, Simon's phone beeped, and Simon be uh, the beeping was telling him that there wasn't enough memory left on the phone. So three minutes worth of him speaking, <laughs> that's enough. Uh, um, so, battery and memory issues of the equipment. Um, memory issues can be, uh, can be dealt with with large memory cards, with a bit of investment, you, you can get over those issues. Battery issues, a much greater problem. Uh, the re renewable batteries, for example, which come in these flip cams, last about 15 minutes. Not great for a two-hour lecture slot. What battery is capable of taking all that material, if you can get a memory uh, both in the equipment and in the students to take in that degree of material? Similarly, how are you going to play that material back? Is it going to be through a CD-ROM? Is it going to be online? Are we going to use Learning Central? Uh, what is the capacity of our online resources to play back a certain length of time lecture, a 45 minute, an hour and a half lecture, a two hour lecture? And let's think about our students actually going to engage with that material in that way. I wouldn't imagine, from my experience within CPLAN, that students would sit down for a two hour lecture and watch it back online if they didn't have to. We're going to do bite-sized chunks. We're going to do a little mini lecture trailer. We're going to do, you know, the things you need to know, almost like a, you know, a condensed lecture online. Just thinking from these practical issues, a range of more pedagogical issues sprung into my mind through this experience. Does it actually defeat the point of lectures? Do we want students in a lecture room? Do we want students in a lecture theatre? And we perform our lecture, depending on. Uh, kind of audience size, I suppose, we might want to interact and get a more dialogic, uh, performative element to our lectures and therefore get more active learning, more higher order learning, more deep learning as a consequence. And do we get that through a straightforward, passive consumption form of dealing with lectures? That we might encourage if we're using the virtual consumption of lectures through lecture capture. So I, I started to think about 
how we could use this technology, given the practical and the ped pedagogical issues, to, use to supplement our existing lectures. I thought that it was rather important, actually, through this getting caught on the wave of new technology, wow, we can do great stuff, to actually think, well, hold on, should we, should we, although we can, should we be doing this stuff, and how should we be doing this stuff? Okay. So, with that in mind, I'm going to struggle to find <laughs> the film that I'd like to show you uh, that illustrates my experiences of using these things. So let's go straight back to here. Simon will edit this back bit out to look just seamless. And so with all these purported benefits of podcasts, a question is set. Is podcasting, has it become a technological tool that can help expand the space of teaching and learning for students in higher education? All students inevitably stop coming to lectures if they can, through lecture capture and podcasts, get all their material online or in some non-interactive situation. I would argue, alongside Frierson, that lectures remain vital to the learning and teaching uh, portfolio of skills if lectures can bring alive a body of knowledge in the minds of students. And it can do that by offering something that podcasts can't, by being interactive, dialogic and an event that students wish to engage in, participate in and attend. However, of course, podcasts do remain useful. Podcasts can help students revise their notes in ways that perhaps are more useful than a textbook because, as we've seen, they can go over material again and again. They give an option to both teachers and learners to deal with the material when the time is most available to them. And perhaps most importantly, for me at least, it can free up time within class for more participation and more in-class discussion and for higher order learning activities such as deep learning. I currently use podcasts in a number of ways and I'll give you some examples after this slide. Firstly, I use podcasts to support seminar reading. Secondly, to support assessment. And thirdly, you're creating a range of new resources to it help students uh, critically learn and use online resources. In the next current academic year, or the upcoming academic year, uh, podcasts are going to be used also in the School of City and Regional Planning to support field study visits and uh, ask students to create their own podcasts alongside the digital um, case studies and film essays they currently make as part of their assessment. So this week in the Geographical uh, Ideas Reading Group, we're looking at critical geographies, radical theory and critical practice. In the lecture, we look at, looked at Karl Marx and his influence on Marxist geographies. And in this reading, um, they were also mentioned in Dispatches Feminism and, and um, Post-Colonial Geographies that we'll be turning to next week. This week, uh, in Duncan Fuller and Rob Kitchen's piece, Radical Theory, Critical Practice, Making a Difference Beyond the Academy, looking at a range of questions, thinking about should what, what uh, inspiration should we take from Karl Marx's notion that geography and geographical knowledge isn't there simply to understand the world, but crucially it's there to transform the world, it's to change the world. What role should we as academics and you as scholarly students have in relation to that world? Is your job simply to understand that world, write good essays, get a good degree? or to use your knowledge, your privileged position almost within society as someone who can afford to and intellectually capable of doing a degree should you use that knowledge in trying to improve the world in some way. In order to realise this project, students will set the task of making a short film or audio slideshow as part of their qualitative methods module. This qualitative methods module involved the research not only exploring respondents' perceptions and interpretations of the world, but also explicitly positioned themselves as active interpreters of their world. The assessment required students to employ a range of qualitative methods, including ethnography, autoethnography, interviews, recorded images, pictures and sound, to portray their interpretation of the place they live in, the place of Cardiff. In other words, following Cohen Smith, the assessment required them to be a tour guide for their city and use a range of mo uh, mobile qualitative methodologies in order to enhance their knowledge of their city. In groups of three, students were asked to drift across the city and inform their drift through one of the following questions. When undertaking the drift, they had to undertake a number of exercises. They had to record their drift using audio recordings, taking photos, making films about 
the landscape they're walking through. They then had to reflect on their experiences through a focus group discussion and use these materials in order to set up a storyboard for their drift that they then made into an audio slideshow. This is a short podcast to show how you can supplement your broader reading on the subject by using online resources, particularly the Scopus resource. As we'll see, Scopus is a really useful um, free online web engine that will allow you to search through a whole range of academic journals to find those that are most relevant for your assessment. Okay. So the first thing we can do is try to find Scopus online. We can straightforwardly do this through, of course, Google. So if we put in Scopus, uh, that's the link we need to get to, www.scopus.com. It's as straightforward as that. Um, we can see a normal domain here, a normal search thing, very uh, similar to Voyager. And we can search via a document, via an author, via an affiliate, and search for an advanced search. Generally speaking, a document search is what you need. So, um, I used digital film technology in a range of ways as a supplement to lectures rather than a replacement for lectures, um, as a way to enable students to articulate their knowledge of issues regarding planning and geography through a different media, to allow students to make films themselves, reposition them in, in terms of their relationship to the city and their relationship to different authorial types of knowledge, and also as a mechanism to, to deal with those everyday question and answers that students have about essay writing, about accessing online resources, etc. etc. I thought it would be useful in the last few minutes to give you an indication more qualitatively of how students uh, receive this introduction of digital technology into into the kind of the teaching repertoire, I suppose. And these were taken, the, these reports were taken both from uh, end, of, end, of end of semester module evaluations, as well as uh, a particular set of focus groups I undertook with third years that were reflecting on the integration of these sorts of activities in their second year. So they had a kind of a year to kind of uh, reflect on their experiences. So students evaluations point out the use of film technology was rather was novel and they appreciated that novelty. The module was taught in an interesting way, lots of different methods used including films, the videos relate well to everyday life, the mix of material helps identifying meanings so ideas of blended learning I guess there, and the style and the use of videos are excellent, some quotations are inspirational both using films that staff has made but also films that you can get from other people and integrate those into the lectures, the students really liked as a way to mix up the straightforward person at the front delivering information. The reflections that students had on making their own films, I was surprised to be overwhelmingly positive. I thought they would be quite uh, reluctant or quite hesitant, uh, particularly perhaps even a generational thing, that would, a, a generational thing influenced my perception of how they might um, uh, interact with these materials. But I guess we have to understand, or you know, perhaps I just need to understand, that students are intrinsically connected to their phones, to beeping something straight to Facebook. They, this is a world they understand, kind of in, they get, to get it straight away. For us, it's a paradigm shift. For them, it's just the world they live in. So students make their own films they really enjoyed. I think, um, uh, I think it made you have to find something you go out there and see in relation to the, the, the assessment that I've just outlined a short podcast on. It made me understand a little bit better than I've just sat here and written an essay. To actually see and engage with people who are actually there involved in it was much better. And it really helped through to their third year where they did their dis dissertation as it helped them see the sort of things they were interested in. They became more far more actively involved. It makes you put the theory into reality. So you read this, then you actually go and do a video about it and you actually experience it yourself. You think, okay, these theories actually make sense. And this theory would be the governing of space or whatever it happens to be. And how does that actually work in reality? When you actually talk to the man, he, the man he was, she was referring to was a, a, a person uh, involved in free running or parkour. He was showing me around and the theories behind it, and he hadn't obviously read the academic theories, um, but he totally agreed with them, and that just reinforced me, uh, and I could really see, really see where he was coming from. People found it a lot more enjoyable, rather than something you're forced to do. They, they perceive that you're forced to bring out academic ideas through. Uh, through a, a conventional form of assessment, for example, an essay. And I think through a film they were trying to link 
connections to the real world themselves and you saw something and thought, oh that would be great if I could link that to a certain theory or I was thinking that about that through the lens of a certain theory and it was more hands on. They were engaging with the theory in a far more active way. A couple of further conclusions about the pride students were taking in this form of assessment, which, although I guess we'd like to think students take pride in their essays and their exams, they were uh, very verbal about their passion about this subject that came alive to them through the use of these sorts of technologies. So it was time consuming for them. Uh, but I think it's something that it's hard to leave. You want to finish it, you want to see your final video, whereas an essay will never be like that. You never think, oh God, I really want to read that essay that I wrote. You do an extra five seconds onto a 10 minute or 12 minute film, and you want to watch it from the beginning, they say, to see how it all links together. To are they creating a coherent argument? All those pennies are dropping in their heads because they see it across a Camtasia timeline. Yeah, it was, I was up till ridiculous o'clock, sort of thinking, oh, if I just get this last bit done, I can watch it up until then. You're always wanting to perfect it. I found it really kept my attention, and I wanted to give it more time. You can see in your head that finished that finish package with sound and images and interviews, and because you can visualise it and watch it, and you can put music on it, it's such an engaging produce. That's why so many people get, got so passionate about it, they say. I remember sitting down with you two gesturing to their friends, and we were just so driven it was stupid. No, you really need to understand why I'm really interested in this subject. They've become really engaged and passionate. So, to conclude, I guess, uh, a member of the student body actually said this, the nature of the task made it a eureka moment for a lot of people, making you see how all the academic theories apply to everyday life. It really set me up for thinking on my own, looking how I can apply it in a more interesting way, rather than simply regurgitating lecture notes. So both for staff, creating their own podcast to supplement their lectures, and allowing students to use this medium, use this technology to articulate their own ideas, I think film, podcast, lecture capture, however we want to call them, can enable a number of positives. It can be used as a, a supplement, a very useful enhancement of our teaching repertoire. It allows us to have increased contact with students, even though it might not be physical contact through students going to our podcast, looking at materials online, and feeling they're plugged in to the teaching scheme without actually using our time in terms of face-to-face -face mm. contact. And we can also, um, students really found also that it diversified their skill base, using technology, <coughs> making pictures to camera, being able to create sequenced ordered storyboards online really helped their broader skills, but also really helped the skills that we want them to use in exams and other forms of essays as well. Um, if I run this by this too quick, conscious of time, um, please email me if you want any more details or go on the, the CPLAN digital website. There's a whole range of podcasts that are put up on there about teaching, learning and research. And there's a lot of student, student films, if you're interested in looking at them, on my own website, spatialmanifesto.com. Thank you. So any questions? I guess.